Good morning everybody, it's a Sunday morning and as I said yesterday we're also going to do a teaching as much as I can on a Sunday. So it's 9 o'clock and I hope you've all tuned in, if not um, I presume you're watching this during the day. We are uh, in the 27th Sunday in Ordinary Time and the text of today's reading is taken from Luke chapter 17 verses 5 to 10 but I recommend you read Luke chapter 17 verse 1 to 10 because then you'll get uh, a better sense. I've entitled today's teaching waiting to be thanked question mark are you waiting to be thanked so I'm going to read the text and I'm going to read it from verse 1 onwards even though our scripture text at Sunday mass is from 5 to 10. Jesus said to his disciples occasions for stumbling are bound to come but woe to anyone by whom they come it would be better for you if a millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea than for you to cause one of these little ones to stumble. Be on your guard. If another disciple sins, you must rebuke the offender. And if there is repentance, you must forgive. And if the same person sins against you seven times a day and turns back to you seven times and says, I repent, you must forgive. Now the verses for today's reading. The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. The Lord replied, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this, mount, this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it would obey you. Who among you would say to your slave who has just come in from the, from the plowing or tending sheep in the field, come here and at once take your place at the table. Would you not rather say to him, prepare supper for me, put on your apron and serve me while I eat and drink, later you may eat and drink. Do you think the slave, do you thank the slave for doing what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were ordered to do, say, we are worthless slaves. We have done only what we ought to have done. The gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Now, throughout the Gospel of Luke, my dear friends, Jesus has repeatedly been critical of the witness and the teachings of the Pharisees. We've seen this. Uh, chapter 15 of Luke's Gospel, uh, the lost coin, the lost sheep, the lost son, begins with, with the Pharisees grumbling that Jesus is eating with tax collectors and sinners and therefore he tells them those three parables. So Jesus has always been very critical in, the, in Luke's Gospel of the Pharisees also because there was a duplicity in the way they lived and he often condemned them as false spiritual shepherds leading people astray while abusing their power. This is something that we as a clergy also need to be mindful of. Are we abusing our power and our position given to us to serve and to love and to be kind. Yeah, we have our failings, but we should never get to that extreme. So Jesus now turns to his disciples as he does to all of us and he speaks to us in the gospel. He speaks to us today of what a true servant of God, the Greek word is doulos, what a true slave really, that's the translation, the, what a true slave of God must really understand. Now, uh, as I said, the pericope of today must be read in its entirety, starting from verse 1. The reality, as Jesus lays out for us, is that all of us are tempted, um, tempted especially when we hold positions of leadership, we are tempted as leaders and we are all prone to stumbling. The word stumbling comes from the Greek word scandalon, from where you get the English word scandal. When you stumble, uh, when you when you cause scandal, you therefore um, destroy not only yourself, you destroy the community. But Jesus says, woe to the leader who does stumble and causes others to also stumble. So Jesus calls the Christian disciple, therefore, to pay attention to oneself. How do we discipline ourselves in a spiritual uh, in our spiritual journey. Yeah? You can't just say, oh, tomorrow I'm going to be good. No, you've got to be specific. You've got to act on it. You've got to plan for it. And you've got to keep reminding yourself that I need to overcome this sin. Otherwise, you're not going to be 
doing it. But then there is also the shared responsibility for one another. Hence, the call to pay attention to the moral life of the members of the community while constantly finding it in one's heart to forgive as Jesus calls us to forgive seven times a day. So it is no wonder that such a tall order made the disciples feel overwhelmed asking the Lord after listening to all of this they say to the Lord, Lord increase our faith. Now they ask for more faith just as we do. Yet Jesus does not offer help at least not the kind the apostles seek. You know, the Greek, um, the Greek syntax of verse uh, 6 of chapter 17 implies really a criticism of the apostles. The Lord replied, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you would say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and they would obey you. Jesus really is scolding them for lacking faith even the size of a mustard seed. He says, you don't even have that. Jesus tells them that they don't need more faith. They simply had to be able to tap into the faith that they already had. They simply needed to put that faith that they had to work, not just ask for an increase of faith. So to this, Jesus now attaches, as we see, a parable, which is the um, pericope of today's gospel passage. The parable is about a master and his slave. It becomes very evident that while the master had a slave, this was still a small household for the slave also doubles up as a farm helper as well as one who took care of the household. So a small household with perhaps one slave who did just about everything. Now slavery was an accepted part of most ancient cultures and Jesus' listeners would understand the point he is making here. You see, in the modern world, we have rejected slavery and we see it as unjust. So to apply this model as Jesus does to the relationship between God and ourselves is likely to make a lot of us feel very, very uneasy. But remember that Luke loves in his gospel to contrast people and to contrast incidents. See, at the background, he has the behavior of the Pharisees, while in the foreground, there is also the lesson for the Christian leader for you and me who perhaps was uh, expecting a reward for his service. Perhaps St. Luke's community had run into some leaders who looked at their service as something that should be rewarded. We see this even in our time. People complain sometimes, Father, my name was not mentioned in the list of people who ought to be thanked. And then you have this sulking going around in the parish. Uh, now, of course, much less uh, uh, in parishes. But you still have people who are upset, oh, his name was uh, announced, father didn't announce my name. And at the back of it, what are you really saying? That we want to be acknowledged, we want to be rewarded. Now, the Pharisees had come to believe that they were entitled. The parable therefore highlights the reality that nobody is entitled, that we are all servants. And as servants, God, the master, owes us nothing. God, in the same way, uh, owes neither you or me or anybody who serves him anything. You see, perhaps the Pharisees and, and as I say now, uh, many Christian leaders sought for their service and seek for their service even today. Reward and even worse, they think that reward should be seen in a higher position I am given. Uh, today I was in charge of this association, I am in charge of the parish council. I need to be promoted. See, power and position are often seen by many who serve in the church as a privilege. Jesus didn't simply uh, redistribute power. Watch this very carefully. Jesus did not redistribute power. He redefined what power was. Can I say that again? Jesus did not redistribute power. He re re redefined it. He redefined it as those who lead are those who will serve. That's what he says. If you are going to be a leader, he says, I'm going to de re redefine what power is. Power is not climbing up. Power is about going down. So the essence of the parable is found today uh, in, if you look at your Bibles, the essence of our parable is found in verses 9 and verse 10. The slave 
who only carries out his master's orders has not earned any right to thanks. Hence, the parable was meant to be a huge dose of realism that saves us from conceit, even sometimes conceit of the spiritual type. So there's a difference between serving God and being a servant of God. The way of Jesus suggests that serving others is a privilege in itself and therefore no reward is necessary. That is why the parable uses the word slave. You see, the reader may ask, why did Jesus not speak against slavery by using a different term? That would have diluted the message of the parable. But some may ask, well, what about my rights? If you are working for God, then what's so wrong to expect some special rights? This was certainly what the religious leaders at the time of Jesus had assumed. Whatever we do, and I want to say this really from all my heart, whatever we do for Christ is no more than what is our duty to do. You see, we are duty bound to serve him by that first and great commandment of loving God with all our heart and with all our soul. Our works are not grounds for any reward in this life. In this life, we receive grace, we receive goodness from God, not rewards. So what can we learn this Sunday morning, my dear friends? That some of us need to face the fact that we have become more like volunteers for God and that he may be even lucky to have us. You see, the word servant or slave is found in one form or another more than a thousand times in the Bible. More than a thousand times. This means that this word slave or servant is a very big deal to God and should be a big deal to us as well, lest we forget our role in the church. When St. Paul wrote the epistle, he was clear of his fundamental identity and we see this in Romans 1 verse 1. He says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, he tells us who he is, his name. This is my name, Paul. And then what he is, he is a servant. You know, but yet at the Last Supper, our God did what no reasonable master would do. He put on his apron and washed the feet of his disciples. He then told them that he did this so that they could do likewise to one another. Today is the 2nd of October. It's also... Uh, Gandhi Jayanti in this country and we remember Mahatma Gandhi who truly became a servant leader, one who served this nation and we continue to pray that all our political leaders, uh, even though sometimes they don't behave like that, we should pray that God may teach them to be servants. Pray also today for church leaders, pray for priests, religious, both men and women, pray for those who serve the church that they may be servant leaders. I also want to wish my friend Gerald Mosquita, who is uh, in Melbourne, a very, very happy birthday. And to also my friends Rohan and Diane, who celebrate uh, their wedding anniversary today. Happy wedding anniversary. To all of you, today may the Lord bless you. And I'd like to leave you with a blessing this Sunday. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you, everybody. Uh, this evening, we'll be back again at 4 o'clock uh, with Why Do Catholics? In case you haven't watched them, Go back and watch the entire, I think I've done about 10 or 12 so far. Um, simple teachings of not more than four minutes. Why do Catholics? Bye everybody, I'll see you at four o'clock.